the live in five, four, three, two, one. We are live now. Warm welcome to the fifty-fifth webinar of Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India. The topic for the today's webinar is recent advances in the management of cerebral palsy. In last three decades, we have seen uh, some significant change in the management of cerebral palsy. But still, as a clinician, we feel that we are not able to do like 100% to our patients. And still, there are a lot of things which we can do or we need to do for our patient. And with that idea, we have organized this webinar. And in this webinar, we are going to see what is going to come in next decade or in next two decades. So uh, first of all, let me give you the outline of uh, this webinar. We have three talks. The first talk is on how to differentiate spasticity from stiffness. We all know that uh, the cerebral palsy muscle, most of the patients are having spasticity. And that over a period of time leads to muscle stiffness. And so now we are dealing with a combination of spasticity and stiffness. So how to differentiate when it comes to the management. The second important topic is interventions to improve balance. I see that uh, inadequate balance is one of the major problem of children with cerebral palsy. And because of that, they need a lot of supporting device. And if we can improve their balance, by some exercise or by some medicine, then probably definitely that will improve the functionality of these children. And then the third topic is treatment goals based on the mechanical concept. And we have Professor Reinald Brunner with us for that. Before we go to the actual presentations, let me give you a brief background about uh, our experts. We have three experts. The first one is Anya Van Kampenheit. She's from Belgium. We have Lise Boyer from USA. And we have Reinald Brunner from Switzerland. And our own Ishwar Ramani is a young pediatric orthopedic surgeon who is going to be a facilitator for this webinar. A brief introduction about our faculty. Anya Van is a, a pediatric orthopedic surgeon at University Hospital of Leeuwen in Belgium. She is also a professor at the University of Leuven. Her main clinical and research area is neuromuscular disorders. And she did her uh, PhD. And the dissertation topic was use of botulinum neurotoxin A in cerebral palsy. And she is one of the key players which has changed our perspective about botulinum in the last decade. Elizabeth uh, Boyer, she is a PhD in kinesiology from Iowa. At present, she is a research scientist at Gillette Children's Hospital, where Jim Gage and the Tom Novacek they are uh, working at present. And her main area of interest is to find out the relation between sensory motor impairments these children have and how those impairments affect the function. So uh, she's going to speak about the balance issue and how we can improve that. Reinald Brunner actually is a very old friend of uh, Posi. He had been to India for at least uh, four or five times. At present, he is professor and head of uh, neurovascular unit at University of uh, Children Hospital of both Basel. And he's in this position for last 36 years. He has vast experience in gait analysis and his main area of interest is to understand the mechanics of gait and how all these factors, they affect the gait deviations. Ishwar Ramani is practicing in Kerala, a young pediatric orthopedic surgeon with extensive training in various fields of pediatric orthopedic. Over and above his knowledge in pediatric orthopedic, he's expert in IT field and he's at present the co-webmaster of POSI, and he's also helping POSI to develop our own registry. And in next few months, we are going to come with a registry for our own country on the supracondylar fracture of humerus. And in that, Ishwar has contributed a lot. 
I am sure that you are going to have a lot of questions because this topic is such that uh, everyone has a question, and you can send your questions to our secretary, Dr. Sandeep Patwardhan, on his WhatsApp and mobile number nine eight two three zero six three nine eight nine. I repeat nine eight two three zero six three nine eight nine. So with that introduction, I hand over to Anya for his first talk. Over to you, Anya. Thank you. Okay, I hope you can see my PowerPoint already. Not yet. Oh, again. Yes. Okay, thanks, Helen. It has done. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so good. Yeah, good morning, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm in Ireland at the moment at the ESMA conference, so my suggest of time is a bit uh, lacking. Um, so I would like to talk about uh, spasticity assessment, and in this case, it's instrumented spasticity assessment. And why is this so? Because when we assess children with cerebral palsy, uh, we look at their problems and we can define their problems where they're like primary problems because of the brain lesion and secondary problems that develop later on. But one of the things that are what we actually assess when we examine the children, um, for example, when you assess an ankle range of motion is joint hyperresistance. And it's kind of hard to fit it in primary or secondary problem. Um, because it's, it's, it combines both muscle contractures and spasticity or hypertonia. Uh, now we know that children with neurological disorders, especially children with cerebral palsy, uh, a lot of them, over 80% in a lot of studies, have spasticity. Uh, but we'd rather call this hyperresistance because if we look at it, it's the combination of both primary and secondary problems. So now when you look at the clinical system, you assess the increased resistance to the passive motion. And uh, because this was kind of a hard concept, we had a, a consensus meeting on this and it was decided on or it was discussed on the fact that hyperresistance is both, uh, has both a non-neural uh, aspect, which is the muscle tissue stiffness and a neural concept, which is the spasticity or the stretch hyperreflexia with some involuntary background activation. Now, when we try to assess this concept, you have the spasticity assessment due to clinical scales, uh, but as you will see later on, it's limited. And then that's why we instrumented the, some centers all developed an instrumented assessment to define the neural from the non-neural um, aspects. So let's look at it. Um, how do we assess clinically this plasticity? <coughs> Typically, this is done by a modified Ashworth scale, uh, where we score the resistance in a specific muscle group by passively moving a joint at one velocity. Now, this is typically an uncontrolled velocity, and it's a subjective feeling of resistance. So here we said it's a one plus, uh, but it's we know that the sensitivity or the reliability of this score is not very high. Uh, the same is true for the modified Tardio scale. It's a bit better because we define uh, two motions and the difference, uh, we can assess it with a, a, a range of motion. Uh, but again, it's a subjective feeling of resistance uh, at an uncontrolled velocity or true velocity. So we define it with the angle at which uh, we feel the stop. Um, to document this, we have two cases. It's a hemiplegic girls and they both have a one plus for gastrocnemius and middle hamstrings. And you can define their tardio scales uh, when you assess it, as I just mentioned. But they do present different. And when you treat them, they also have different outcome results. Now, let's look again at the um, definition of spasticity, which says it's a velocity dependent increase and stretch reflex. And maybe we can define this uh, using uh, other means than just the subjective uh, resistance. Now we can um, measure the velocity at which we move the joint using uh, an instrument uh, when we do the motion. Uh, we can measure the tonic stretch, tonic stretch reflex on the muscle when we measure the EMG. 
And at the same time, we can measure the reactive resistance uh, or the power with which we have to move the joint also with an instrument. So when we combine these three uh, assets, um, this is what we do what we uh, use the what we do when we do the instrumented assessment of spasticity. So we measure the torque, we measure the joint angle of motion, and we measure our EMG when we assess, in this case, for example, the medial hamstrings or specifically the semitendinosis. We can do the same for other muscles, the adductors, the calf muscles, typically the medial gastrocnemius, uh, as I said, the hamstrings, and also the quadriceps, or more specifically, the rectus femoris. So here's an example. We do a slow stretch. And typically in normal, uh, typically developing adults or, or children uh, without neuromuscular problems, uh, there is no muscle activity when we move the joint, when we stretch the gastrocnemius at a slow velocity, and we see that the resistance gradually improves, uh, in, in, um, goes up. Now, when we do the fast stretch, um, in healthy persons, we would not see a lot of muscle activity or no muscle activity, but in patients with cerebral palsy, for example, we see that there is an increase in muscle activity shown by the EMG activity, and the, the resistance of the stretch is higher than when you do the, the movement slower. So again, the same uh, with position, velocity, um, gradually, uh, which is at a slow velocity, and then the torque that goes up gradually. On top of this, the fast stretch, uh, where the position stops, which at the point, point that we know from the tardio scale is the, the moment of catch. Um, and we have the high velocity, which certainly drops, and then the EMG activity. Um, now from this, we can derive certain parameters, which we can use uh, to define the type of spasticity, uh, which can be different in different muscles and in different patients, but also to look at the eff effect of treatments and to define uh, which treatments might be a good option. That's what we our ultimate goal uh, was when we uh, started working on this. So again, we have factors that give information about the position. We have information about EMG or muscle activity, and we have information about inf information about the torque at a certain angle or the power that we must use to move the joint. Um, so again, a typical developing child, slow stretch and fast stretch EMG is silent. But with child with CP, at slow stretch in this muscle, no activity, but at fast stretch, you see the activity. Um, so slow, medium, and high velocity, again, for a typical developing child, no EMG activity. And when we do this in a certain increased velocities and, re and repeat it, we have uh, more EMG activity. So we did the same for the two children that were like, what were defined about the same um, with our clinical exam. And now we see that when we do the instrumented specificity assessment, we see differences. And we see that only at a very uh, high velocity uh, in Elin, the one child, we see that there is EMG activity. And on the contrary, in the other child, we see that even at a lower velocity, uh, we see that there was uh, already EMG activity. So they present differently. So this is here how you see um, that the EMG activity is different. Um, same was so for the hamstring. So we did both muscles and we saw that they presented differently. Uh, remember, we have the angle of catch when you do the modified RGO scale, which is subjective. It's you feel the resistance and then you measure it. And it has been shown also to be quite inaccurate. But with these uh, instrumental specificity assessment, you can nicely measure when the torque goes up and also assess at which joint angular position this is true. So you can assess it more uh, accurate and more objectively. So this is one way of using this uh, instrumented assessment. Of course, it's not something that we do like daily in the clinic, but we use it quite often in uh, research and research mostly looking at which treatment is best to, def to, to get rid of spasticity or to define stiffness. Um, I'm not going into the detail, but we um, 
using this instrument, the spasticity assessment. Uh, it's of course important that it's a reliable assessment that it, we can repeat it and also that it's responsive to treatment. So we did a lot of uh, studies to um, prove that it's reliable, valid, sensitive, and it has a predictive ability. And also that it was sensitive to improve with botulinum toxin treatment. Um, one thing that we found was when we assessed, when we looked at those children, um, is that um, not every child is the same and not every muscle is the same. And we saw certain patterns in certain muscles. Uh, here, for instance, you see again, gastrocnemius at slow stretch silent and at fast stretch we saw already activity. And in a lot of hands, this is what we saw quite often in gastrocnemius, not in every gastrocnemius, but very often. And in hamstrings, we more often saw that there was already some activity also at slow stretch. Um, so we did a study where we defined the different positions in zones. And what we saw is when you looked at it um, from a sort of three-dimensional way where the activity is presented in EMG in the height of the blocks. And you can look at it from how fast we did the stretch um, going from um, on the right side and also the, the different position on where the stretch was on the left side. Um, and we could sort of define sort of spasticity patterns. So some muscles already are active at a very slow stretch and other are active only at high stretch. And some muscles were active when you go through a certain zone, uh, independent on how fast the stretch was. So we, we chose, it, it, we saw certain patterns more in certain muscles uh, and we called it a velocity dependent stretch or a, um, position dependent pattern, okay? And then to define whether certain muscles are more prone to effect of botulinum toxin as a spasticity reduction, uh, we took a look at uh, effects of what um, the botulinum toxin did on certain muscles. And we uh, made a cutoff on muscles that were more like velocity dependent pre botulinum toxin and others that were more position dependent on EMG um, presentation um, also before the botulinum toxin. And we saw when we looked at their gait pattern after the botulinum toxin injections, um, that children with muscles that were more length dependent um, or position dependent um, had um, not such a good um, outcome of the botulinum toxin than those that had velocity dependency. I'm not going into the details of on the statistical parametric mapping that we did to define this, uh, but what is very important is that we see that we, when we inject hamstrings and want to reduce spasticity, uh, uh, one of our goals is that we want to improve knee extension at terminal stance or at initial contact. Um, and when we used, when we looked at the velocity dependent hamstrings, we saw that they were improving at this certain point of time. Um, in contrary to the others, the length or uh, dependent muscles, where we saw that they even increased in knee flexion. Um, after the botulinum toxin. So we had a, a bad outcome in that type of muscles. So there you can define whether botulinum toxin is a good idea in certain muscles and certain hamstrings and in others it is not. So a better knee extension in contrary to more knee flexion uh, at terminal stance in the other group of hamstrings. Uh, so by looking at spasticity patterns, we see that some muscles in some children um, have a different spasticity pattern than others. And in relation to this, that's what we are currently doing. We are looking at the uh, muscle structures and other muscles properties to see whether we can define why they behave differently. Uh, but I think that's a topic for another discussion. Uh, but just to, doc to tell, to document that we use the more fancy instrumented spasticity to study muscle reaction on certain medication on certain treatments um, and that it can guide us uh, to define what treatment is a good idea in some patients and why it is not in other patients. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you, Anya, for describing uh, your research. And definitely, we will have a lot of questions on this, but uh, we will come to questions after all the three lectures are over. So now I invite uh, Lise Boyer for her presentation. Thank you again for the introduction and the invitation to come speak to you on the interventions to improve balance in individuals with cerebral palsy. <coughs> it almost goes without saying that balance is important. And it's important because many of our patients come to us and have concerns about their excessive tripping and falling. And in multiple studies, Tripping and decreasing trips and falls is often listed as the most important goal or one of the top three. Furthermore, parents or caregivers often self-report that balance seems to be the most limiting factor in their child's walking ability, more than, for instance, endurance and weakness or pain. Objectively, in the lab, we can also quantify balance. And several studies have shown that balance explains a large amount of variance in particularly our gross motor outcomes, such as the tug, the timed up and go, or the GMFM or PD scores. Balance then can be defined and measured multiple ways, um, statically or dynamically. <clears throat> we can also break down dynamic balance further into anticipatory balance and reactive balance. Um, in relation to voluntary movement versus responding to an external perturbation. <clears throat> so the conditions for being stable, be, having good balance from a physics perspective include, for instance, greater mass, lower center of mass, and larger base of support, as shown here in the graphic. And so applying those same concepts to individuals with cerebral palsy, uh, they do tend to uh, weigh less, at least when they are younger. Their mass tends to be slightly distributed more proximally because they have, especially those with bilateral lower extremity involvement, they have decreased muscle mass and bone mass. And we can also have problems with base of support. So if you're walking up on your toes in a quinus gait, or if we have extreme external or internal rotation of the feet, that's going to decrease your anterior posterior base of support. And so they may adapt with how they move, with their walk, taking wider steps or using assistive devices to help out in that regard. We can't also forget about the sensory systems that work to provide us information about our balance state, um, our vision, our vestibular, our somatosensory, including proprioception ability, and of course the motor impairments that we see. So all of these, systems need to be working well and integrating that information efficiently and correctly in order to have good static and dynamic balance. So given that we have these sensory motor impairments, we're going to now look at some interventions that we can do to help out these children. And we'll look to the literature and review some of the data from our systematic reviews and further. Obviously, we want to draw our inferences about which in interventions to do based on the best quality evidence, if it's available. And so the highest level of evidence is usually considered to be meta-analyses of multiple RCTs or clinical trials. <clears throat> in those studies, we're going to be talking about standardized mean differences. Uh, which essentially are effect sizes. And so you'll see those coming up later in my discussion. They can be summarized for the different studies and usually reported in a forest table like this as what's kind of that average effect across these different studies. Standardized mean differences are really effect sizes, looking at the difference in the means between groups as normalized or divided by the standard deviation of those groups. And so the traditional interpretation is that small effect sizes are means separated by 0.2 standard deviations and large effect sizes are separated by 0.8 standard deviations or more. <clears throat> Talking now about some of the interventions, uh, this is not by any means 
uh, a full comprehensive list, but it should touch on several different varieties that exist in the literature. I'll focus first on interventions that require an active participant to be actively involved and participating. So we'll start with treadmill training. And I want to orient you to these graphs, these tables, because I present information similarly. So we have our author, the year, yes or no, whether it's a systematic review with a meta-analysis of RCT studies, the number of studies in there, number of participants, their age, and then sometimes not all of the studies report balance outcomes. So I provide that number here. The dose of the treatment, in this case, the direction that they walked, the level of evidence, control, and then the outcomes. So for this backwards walking intervention, uh, systematic review that included two different studies, they actually found improvements of about up to 34% in COP center of pressure. So more of that static standing balance. But we have another more recent study from 2021 in which they compared backward walk walking to forward walking and using a different outcome of balance, the pediatric balance scale, PBS, they reported 8% improvements versus 3%. Another form of treadmill training is partial body weight treadmill training. And that's what this RCT here in 2017 looked at in addition to conventional physical therapy. And they reported greater improvements with the addition of that partial body weight supported treadmill training. Cycling has also been investigated in, systematic, in a systematic review. And there was only four studies though that reported balance outcomes and only one that reported PDS. But in there, they noticed, uh, they reported an effect size, a standardized mean difference of about one, which is large. But using different surrogates of balance, such as the GMFM total score or dimensions D and E, across the different studies, we have a variety of outcomes from pretty much no effect to very large effects. So cycling could be an option. Hippotherapy has been studied a little bit more extensively in CP. Um, in particular, they include more non-ambulatory individuals versus many of the other interventions today primarily look at ambulatory individuals with CP. In this 2020 systematic review of over four studies that included balance outcomes, they did not see big differences in PBS or GMFM domains. Note here, they did not report standardized mean differences, just mean differences, so points. How many points did they were the two groups? Um, so no differences reported there, but they did show some improvements in center of pressure and some seated assessment scale. Uh, these general null findings were also uh, reported back in 2013 in a different study. Finally, the last study is interesting, this 2021 study. Not only did they use a horse simulator, but they also incorporated virtual reality headsets. And so this study, like the others before it, didn't show large improvements in GMFM total score. These are percent changes. But they did see slightly larger improvements in the pediatric balance scale. So here's an example there. Um, and again, NS is not insignificant. Continue with that virtual reality theme, which might include those VR headsets that you saw, some video games or extra gaming, visual surrounds as kind of shown here, Nintendo Wii boards um, connect. This is by far the most well-studied intervention looking at balance outcomes in this population. We have three systematic reviews alone, two of which are of RCTs and while not all of the studies reported some type of a balance outcome, several of them did. So referring here then, on average, we see small to large effects for the different balance outcomes that they report. Um, however, there are some one-legged stance trial and center of pressure measures that they did not show significant improvements over uh, conventional therapy for the most part. But this work is continuing. There's been at least five other RCTs in the last couple of years. And again, variable results, some are in the non, no effect to moderate effects. 
one study, one systematic review did look at the dosage and they didn't see any stark differences in outcomes. Strength training uh, has been evaluated also, sometimes comparing it to no treatment or conventional therapy or other types of therapy. And in, this, in these eight studies that report some type of balance outcomes, they did not observe very large differences in total score or dimension D, but they did note small effects for dimension E on the GMFM. Perturbation treadmill, uh, well, I shouldn't say treadmill train, but perturbation training can be training where you stand on a force plate and it unexpectedly moves AP or medial lateral. And there's been one systematic review and then another study coming out that same year. Um, only two studies in that systematic review, most often comparing just baseline levels, uh, but they did report across the variables, you know, 21 to 63% increases or improvement in their outcomes. Uh, so this is encouraging. This is in the short term. What is probably even more encouraging is that one month after treatment, at least one study showed maintenance of that upright uh, static standing ability. Now something perhaps more fun is dance and adaptive dance, uh, for instance, has been reviewed. Our level of evidence is kind of dropping here, but there is one systematic review on it. Uh, some of the sample sizes were just one to 44 um, in the studies, but there were six studies included in this. They did not provide objective numerical outcomes, but did conclude that balance is usually enhanced with dance. And in these other studies, including two case reports at the bottom here, again, dance does seem to help these patients improve their uh, static and dynamic balance. Um, though it is not consistent and more research is definitely needed in this area. Shifting gears now to more passive interventions. And I know arguably robotic gait training can be both passive or active. Um, so this is where I group that, so humor me. This 2017 systematic review did show that uh, there weren't really significant improvements in balance, at least as measured by the GMFM dimension D or E. Orthopedic surgery, um, probably most interesting to the, of interest to this group. There really did not seem to be many studies that specifically measured balance outcomes. This one systematic review and meta-analysis identified seven studies that measured some type of a balance outcome, but the the total score in the GMFM was not significantly different, though two studies reported dimensions D and E, and we do seem to see have a benefit there. So more work to be done, um, including exploring the effect of surgery versus the intense post-op physical therapy that often occurs simultaneously, which can be beneficial perhaps in itself. Non-invasive brain stimulation can also be utilized. And there's one systematic review here of uh, over 10 studies that reported some type of balance outcome. You see a lot of non-significant differences here, though the trends, the effect size, the standardized mean differences are small to, lar or small to medium. Um, so perhaps some of this is due to small sample sizes. Specifically looking at center of pressure during static standing, eyes open or eyes closed, there were small to large improvements there. And again, these are me uh, sorry, immediate effects. Some of the one month retention effects on, are still present and some now have become significant uh, while, while others kind of had reverse directions and showing a lack of benefit there. So um, interesting interesting treatment, passive treatment there. Whole body vibration. I feel like this is gaining traction for many different outcomes, but balance is one of them. A 2015 systematic review that included two studies that measured balance. Again, here we're reporting mean difference, not standardized mean difference, but they did not report any group differences for timed up and go. 
for the GMFM dimension B, though there were th a three point difference in dimension E in that study. For the remaining three RCTs since then, it seems like we're observing more benefit here. Um, improvements ranging from approximately 18% improvement to 35% and then a large effect size here, for instance, versus some core stability exercises. So exciting work being done in that realm. Orthotics, I think almost all of us would say, if you have the right orthotic, you're gonna instantaneously improve balance. And for the most part, that's what these two observational studies in 2021 have shown compared to barefoot. Um, you're improving their static as well as clinical and dynamic balance uh, based on the measurements chosen here. In this systematic review from 2018, if you read their conclusion, they say that there's not strong evidence to say that orthotics help. But if you actually look into the studies that they cite, many of them were smaller pilot studies. And so they were just underpowered to detect statistical differences. So I've pulled some of the effect sizes from the GMFM and then PBS. And you can see that we have approximately small effect sizes for uh, orthotics. Uh, but there was, for instance, no significant difference in some of the center of pressure variables, including one study that used a hinged AFO, um, which obviously provides less support than a solid AFO. Here now, we're bringing in some more technology. Um, and these, these new studies don't really have uh, any RCTs or large high quality evidence to support them. So this is more kind of a coming soon. Uh, but so stochastic resonance, which is kind of this low, sometimes subsensory threshold noise, uh, random noise, maybe electrical or mechanical in orientation or in um, origins. And this one study looked at vestibular nerve electrical stimulation. Uh, this was actually a sham condition just to kind of get feasibility and if kids would actually wear it. Um, so I expect more from their group. I believe this was a group in Ireland. And then this pilot study was done using electrical stimulation on the lower extremity muscles and showed improvement in center of pressure measures. And then finally, these vibrating insoles was not performed in a CP study, but um, I can see obviously applications based on everything that these studies are starting to show and their use in other clinical populations. So. More to come from that, hopefully, in the next few years from those groups. Wrapping up now, a uh, quick summary and, and looking at where our future opportunities are. I think naturally we say which intervention is best. And in the exercise world, we always say the best exercise is the in exercise that you do. So whichever intervention that these kids are going to do and not feel stigmatized for doing them or wearing them or using devices is probably what it's gonna have most success in the real world. We do seem to show that active participation from the participant has the best outcomes though. And some of our data presented here today suggests that for instance, treadmill training, virtual reality, and perhaps these perturbation inner uh, protocols will result in the largest in impacts. More work to, needs to be done though to figure out what is that optimum dosage? What are the retention, long-term retention effects? And how about we can start measuring fall frequency? Common concern, we can ask about it and use that as some of our outcome measures and balance trials. And the age-old question of, is this statistical difference clinically meaningful? for the child. And if their main concern is falls, can we borrow some of the research and the interventions used in elderly adults, such as Tai Chi or um, perturbation training to in decrease their falls as well? Thank you. And references. Yeah, thank you, Liz, for a beautiful explanation about the evidence related to so many treatments, which is available to improve balance. And uh, one of my teacher used to say that when there are so many options available, probably that gives you an indication that none of them is really working. 
<laughs> so uh, is it uh, right for this uh, uh, the balance intervention uh, we will come we will discuss that uh, in the uh, question and answer session so now i request uh, rainal gruner to have his views about uh, mechanical abnormalities and how this leads to the uh, problem and how we can use them in the decision making yeah thank you very much dear for your kind words and uh, I welcome everybody to my talk, which will be more on mechanics and even physics. But I think it is important that we get more understanding of what we do. Now, so policy, we have realized this, looking at the other two talks is a very complex problem. That's clear to all of us, but still we should consider much more that it's a sensory motor deficit, not only a motor deficit, you will never have an adequate motor answer if you have an inadequate sensory input. So I think that is an essential part. And that in all these deficits include then spasticity. We know that there is a lack of uh, inhibition from proximal neurons, but there are other reasons for spasticity which are still unknown. Whatever, when, if you behave and, and function under these conditions, you need to compensate for certain problems. And these compensations finally will lead to adaptations of your locomotor system and also your neurological system. And uh, so you will have deformities and functional abnormalities. And what we should realize is not everything is reversible. So for example, I'm not talking about the mechanical part now, but on the neuromuscular control, I once introduced the tibialis anterior tendon shortening together with the um, tender Achilles lengthening to correct uh, drop feet and equinus feet in hemiplegic CP patients. And I thought, wonderful, if I give them back the possibility to dorsiflex, they would use it. And to my great surprise, you see this in these two EMG pictures before and after, there's no change. So um, I think we need to understand what makes the brain change a certain a strategy which has been fixed, and we need to understand much more than just mechanics. But still, if I, I still come back to the mechanics because that's another world that we have to understand. You see here a hemiplegic patient, and uh, the great question is now, if you have such a deformity, you need to correct it, but to which degree and how much is acceptable? So, when does the patient profit and benefit from what we do and when does, doesn't he do that anymore? And I think that is a major question. Our current concept is that we correct all structural and functional deformities thinking that a normal anatomy provides best, uh, a best basis for functional optimization. This is not quite true. We know that from clubfoot, clubfoot treatment, we had the Cincinnati approach where everything was taken apart these feet were wonderfully uh, reconstructed. All these bones were in the right place, but in the second or third decade of life, these, these feet were too stiff. They were not uh, functional anymore, and many of these patients were in pain. On, in contrast to this, you have uh, the Ponzetti treatment, which not always uh, reaches an optimal normal um, skeleton, but still these feet function in a normal way and the patients can have a much better functional outcome than after this anatomical reconstruction. So I think we need to understand that not always deformities produce a functional problem. We treat spasticity, we treat spasticity because we think that, uh, that uh, if we treat this abnormal muscle activity, then the function will improve and that we correct and prevent um, by treating spasticity of normal muscle activity, muscular and bony deformities. However, there was a nice study from the Gillette group actually last year, this study which compared the non-treated and treated uh, patients with spasticity. And the only change, if I remember well, was or the only, only difference was that the patients who had spasticity treatment had less spasticity but otherwise they were more or less the same. So um, yeah, I think that is something that we need to understand. So in summary, we have a very incomplete understanding of cerebral palsy on the whole, 
of biomechanics within this cerebral palsy and all the adaptive changes. And as long at least as we have this poor understanding, normal function is anyway an unrealistic goal. We will never correct the sensory problems and we have to consider the mental parts and the muscular control part as well, which is poorly accessible to our at least surgical treatment. And what finally comes out is that we may have an overtreatment of what we do, so we do too much. And the second thing is, what is really the goal? What do we really need to achieve in, from considering the biomechanical situation? That's why I try to show you what we know. And when is the situation critical? When is it acceptable? And to which amount do we need to correct the deformity? So that's another point of, of problem. Um, a good example is the concept of lever arm diseases, what we all know and we all treat. We have this midfoot break and you see these severely um, functionally deformed legs on the load. And it's clear that these patients have problems. But how much of foot deformity is acceptable? So not all patients are that bad. Some have mild deformities. And if I correct these severe deformities, do I need to have a complete correction of the foot? And what is more important, the direction of rotation or the stability within the foot, this intrinsic stability? We don't know. And another problem is femur antiversion. You know that uh, if the patient has an increased antiversion, that the lever arm for these hip adductors is low and we have this low um, abductor moment in gait, which leads to hip and knee flexion finally. But again, what, to which degree do we need to correct this antiversion? Um, some correct it to normal anatomy, normal antiversion, some correct it to the midpoint of rotation, some correct the deviation in gait. Um, it all works to some degree. We all are not completely happy with what we get and we simply don't know. And I have no answer to this, but I think this is kind of the problem that we are facing. We have no clear um, idea, concept what we need to reach in an individual patient. So let's come to another problem, hamstring overactivity. Um, we see this as a reason for um, knee flexion, especially in crouch gait. But if we have a crouch gait, we actually overload our knee extensors. What we then do is we lean forward, simply mechanically, we all know, know this. And this leaning forward position needs to be controlled and it's controlled by the hip extensors. And the hip extensors are to some part the hamstrings. And what we have shown is that on the load, that is this here, hamstrings are actually extensors. They extend the hip and they may also extend the knee indirectly. So the, um, the core activity of hamstrings and vastai actually leads to even more extens extensor power in your body. And I think we need to understand that hamstring lengthening interferes with this compensatory hamstring uh, activity and may produce problems. And the other thing is, if I constantly overload my muscles, especially my biarticular muscles, that's what we know from everybody who does sports, then these muscles have a tendency to become short without any spasticity, without anything else. A normal muscle overly used has a tendency to become short. So these hamstrings get short at least for this reason and there are other reasons as well. And that not, not necessarily is a reason that we need to lengthen them. So I think we have to understand that hamstring overactivity is a mechanism to cope with the knee flexion gait, could be, um, could be uh, in equinus or in hyperdorsiflexion, which is called crouch. And whether they do really flex the knee, um, I'm not quite sure. It, it certainly depends on the position. Now we rely on the popliteal angle and this is one of the main indications that we use for uh, surgery. But if I try to, um, to, uh, um, to uh, show these limitations from the rectus or the hamstrings found in clinical um, surroundings, and I transport this to the normal knee flexion extension curve. We're actually far away 
even if you have short hamstrings, minus 55 degree, 55 degrees for pitial angle, or a Duncan Ely rectus length of 80 degrees, you're still away from what affects your gait pattern. So your clinical decision-making on a situation which is not a functional situation may be erroneous. Of course, you may have functional contractures. That's another thing. That's what Anja Kampenhardt was talking about. That is certainly more relevant and they, that may cause limitations earlier, but we do not get it when you look at the popliteal angle. And the next point is that we know, several studies have shown this, that about one third of patients have only have short hamstrings. All others have normally long or long hamstrings. So that means that, again, we are misled by our concept that, that the hamstrings flex the knee. They are far more uh, um, and in, have an interplay with the knee extensors and work as extensors in your, <coughs> in your legs. So muscle, the biarticular muscles may be short without having an effect on function. And we need to prevent this um, need for an overuse of muscles. And the closer we get to this position, 0, zero 90, in standing and even in stance you engage in mid stands, the closer we are getting to this position, the less we overuse our muscles. So that's one reason why we need to get to this position and why it's reasonable to fight for this. But again, be careful with lengthening of hamstrings and even of rectus. Another thing is toe walking and hip internal rotation. I know that's one of the things that I always talking about. And I think it's it, it always surprises me that uh, it is very difficult um, to take that over to clinical practice. If you plan to flex your, your foot and it's only the soleus which is active in this model, you have everything that you see in a hemiplegic patient. And here's a patient walking with equinus and I only corrected the, um, uh, the equinus with a little bit of hamstring surgery, no correction of rotation. And you see that she's much better aligned. So if you, if you go for um, a correction of equinus, that would improve your um, hip rotation as well. I've done that afterwards using this kind of orthosis where I accept the equinus which is present and I compensate by a heel. What I do with this kind of orthosis is I transfer toe walkers into a heel toe gait pattern patient. And this is only a cross-sectional study, so nothing really severe, but what I checked is whether I find an asymmetrical hip internal rotation with the leg extended on the couch or not. I think that if you always walk with internal rotation, your capsule must be loose in the direction of more internal rotation. And what we found actually, that is interesting, if these patients really were converted, and that is uh, the major part, 56 of these 70, then you had a symmetrical rotation in your hips. Whereas those who were not converted or didn't wear the orthosis, were not had a, a difference of about 15 degrees more internal rotation in their hips. So this is interesting because it is only a mechanical point which I correct, nothing considering spasticity, no surgery, nothing else. It is just wearing the orthosis with a functional orthosis or not. Now, I know that there are for hip internal rotation, we have several um, concepts which we consider. We had the, inter, the, the concept that it comes from spastic internal rotators, especially the abductors and hamstrings. And that was proven wrong by Arnold and the uh, and Delp group in uh, 2000. So we know this is not true. The next thing is we pretend that um, we want to have the foot aligned to the direction of gait. So if your pelvis rotates backwards, you must internally rotate your hip to get your foot aligned. That's fine. But first, that doesn't happen in all patients. There are many patients who e either overdo it, so they have more internal rotation than required, or they do not enough. 
And the second problem is what causes pelvic rotation? So we have a hypothesis which is not completely explained. The next thing is femoral antiversion. This is something that we consider as the main factor for rotational problems. But again, why should femoral antiversion be a primary problem? And if it's a secondary problem, we should address it in a different way. But we know from the ancient Wolf's Law, this is a very ancient, 150 years ago, published um, paper from Wolf, a German uh, orthopedic surgeon, who described that form follows function. So if the function is in a certain way, your form will change and adapt to this function. This means if I have too much femoral diversion in a patient who has uh, five, six, seven years of age, he had enough time to adapt the femoral diversion to his gait pattern and not the other way around. And the last thing is the pure mechanics explain the problem and a study which corrects this pure mechanics shows that it works. So I think this is not a uh, concept which is completely out of, um, or should, should not be completely out of attention. Now you can um, easily decide whether you will have an effect uh, of correction of a, uh, of a, he of a toe walker into, uh, with an orthosis and convert him into a heel toe walker. If you have a free pendulum test, as you see here, then your problem is at the foot level. And if you correct the foot, the patient will have an almost normal walking pattern. Whereas if your problem is in the knee, you will always have a toe contact first. So that's another problem. But at least you can use it. You can use this test or you can test with an AFO. And if you have a very short foot, like in this case, because the foot is so um, so, in, so much in equinus, you can actually add a carbon insole as a lever arm, and so you can give the patient a normally long foot. That works if the patient is unstable. The next thing is rectus function during gait. We consider stiff knee gait as a problem of rectus. But uh, what you see here is a normal gait cycle where we only changed rectus force, which is usually active in pre-swing and initial, initial swing. And it's, the rectus is active to accelerate the foot segments for the swing phase. So if the force is reduced, you actually have no heel, -toe, heel contact, you have a toe contact. And if you overdo your um, rectus activity, so if you have too much, then you have a heel contact like a Russian soldier. So um, this means that if you do a weakened rectus, and in CP patients, the rectus is anyway weak with all other muscles, it has, a tenden it has a tendency to increase the toe walking problem in a patient. So rectus surgery for me is a critical thing because little, you have little effect on your swing phase. You get five or 10 degrees more flexion, which is not very much, but you have a danger that you increase toe walking. And surprisingly, no one study, none study shows uh, results on foot contact after rectus surgery. So restore the first rocker, and then you should actually improve the hip rotation and at the long run, that's something that we need to study, femoral diversion as well. Heel down is not enough because what you need is the forward drive of your leg with your, with your deambulation from heel to toe. And be, be careful with interventions which interfere with muscles for swing phase. The next point is uh, the contraction of the plantar flexors. We consider this as the plantar flexion extension couple and know that this is something which is important. And actually, the um, function of the triceps surae is crucial for a normal gait pattern because the, the triceps, especially the soleus, controls tibia position in space. And if you have a lean forward, it is very, very difficult, if not impossible at all, to get a uh, extended knee on top of a leaning forward tibia. So it is essential that your calf muscles control your tibial advancement. 
Now, if you, um, again, we t- I, I had the impression that that depends on the position of segments in space. And what we did here is we had, again, the calf muscles um, activated with various positions of hip and knee joint in space. Here's only the knee, but what you see is that with the knee extended to 10 degrees, an extension comes. 20 degrees is fine, but if the knee is flexed 30 degrees, your plantar flexors actually do the opposite. They flex the knee. So that means that you actually overload your knee extensors if your knee flexion is beyond 20 or 25 degrees. And this explains why some patients, even if you give them um, uh, antifoot orthosis, still walk with a flexed knee. We, that there is some, in, some dependence on the position of the ground reaction force. So if your ground reaction force is far in front, then you, you tolerate more knee flexion. But as a, as a general rule, you can say that at about 20 degrees of knee flexion, you're in the dangerous zone when you walk. That's not very much. So you really need to avoid knee flexion deformities. And uh, especially you should avoid any knee joint contracture. And what is usually happening is, and not many of, uh, of us test so, is that if I lift the leg of a patient, then you, or of an individual on the foot, then actually the leg should, should fall in complete extension. But in CP patients, that is usually not the case. So there is an elastic, if I push, I can get into extension, but there's an elastic resistance. And this elastic resistance is a problem because that initiates the knee flexion deformity. You will never fight against your own body. And I use this kind of splints and uh, I try to get rid of the problem. And in young patients, it, were, it works well. I discussed it with, with Freeman Miller and actually he has the same problem, but he did early hamstring lengthening in these patients. And he says that the patients recover full knee extension and have no problems of anterior tilt of the pelvis. I don't know, I went that way, but I'm now considering in patients where that is not efficient to, to do hamstring lengthening. So this is a problem, this elastic resistance needs to be detected, it's a mechanical problem, and it should be treated as early as possible. And as a rule, keep your knee during gait below 20 degrees of flexion. So as a summary, I can say we have a complex problem. We have a mechanical, neurological, mental, and combined uh, factors which influence each other. A purely mechanical analysis at least allows you to formulate physical treatment goals. So this is physics. This is not something um, purely medicine where you treat a group of patients and see what comes out. And the, what we found is biarticular, biarticular muscles may be clinically short, but may not have a necessarily an effect on function. We need to restore the first rocker. We need to um, to um, correct. We need to correct the knee flexion deformity, and an equinus has little importance as long as the heel is compensated and the heel toe gauge is reached. But we don't know about many other things that we correct, and we really need much more of such information to get a clearer picture what we orthopedically need to reach. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Rainal. You are always thinking outside the box, and I really appreciate that uh, your ideas are very different than what we usually get it from the textbooks. So uh, I have received a few questions, and I would like to ask those questions first before I hand over to Ishwar for the further question. The first question is from Jayant from Bangalore, and uh, that question is to Anya Wen. Uh, like you describe a lot of research tools. How do we use all these tools in the clinical practice? Uh, well, at, at, when we look at how we do it right now, um, if it's a, a child where I do not see the immediate, I, when there's questions, shall we use botulinum toxin or not? 
uh, because we, of course, as many centers have gone down in our use and become even more selective. Um, sometimes um, I even question myself, shall I do it or not? Or shall I use serial casting? And, and as even serial casting is, is an intervention, um, I do uh, use this clinical assessment, this, this instrumented assessment to help me guide towards treatment because a study that I haven't mentioned is where we compared um, the outcome of serial casting versus botulinum toxin uh, in the typical, in the different muscles and in the different, different spasticity patterns. And we saw that if there's more um, velocity dependent pattern, it's better to use serial casting than in the velocity dependent pattern. So uh, we now use it in clinic and I know it's, it's, if you don't have the tool, you can't use it, but looking at different muscles um, and what we've reported and will report is that it, some muscles don't respond as well to botulinum toxin as others and don't respond as well to other botulinum toxin, to other spasticity treatments. Um, and for, for example, the hamstrings, you can have a deterioration of gait by using spasticity uh, treatments. Um, and that's what you can use it as a research tool. Uh, to be more specific for our country, uh, we have three treatments available for management of the short muscles, non-operative treatment. The first one is the splints, which uh, Reinald suggested. Uh, the same design, uh, we can use it for hamstrings or we can have it for the calf. So that is first option, the stretching splint. The second option is a stretching cast. We give a plaster for two or three weeks. That's the second option. We can do it every week or we give a one plaster and we keep it for three weeks. That's the second option. And the third option is botulinum neurotoxin. So of the three, if I have to select how your research can help me in selecting the best treatment. I think when what we've seen is that there's different types of spasticity patterns and it's related to the muscles. So we know for hamstrings, for example, botulinum toxin doesn't work in, in a lot of the hamstrings. It doesn't do much good. Uh, it's also a bit age specific. So there's this age region, typically like three to six, maybe seven, where botulinum toxin has a better effect. Um, but when they're older, you have more stiffness. And that's what we've also shown that the non neural aspect becomes more prominent when their children become older. Um, so I think, although casting seems to be an easy treatment, it's, it's of course not tolerated very well by every child. Uh, so if it's a more typical spasticity, fast catch, um, it seems that toxin works better, especially for gastrocnemius, and that for an older children with more neural, non-neural uh, um, problems, uh, casting may be a good tool, but even in those, in, in, other, in every child, child's uh, casting, uh, first of all, is tolerated very well, and secondly, gives the outcome that you want to have, because it's, studies have shown that casting doesn't solve um, every contracture or releases every uh, equinus problem. So, um, I don't say that instrumented spasticity assessment will help us resolve every re every research uh, question that we have. Um, but it has shown us that what we thought was that with botulinum toxin, for instance, as a spasticity reduction, um, we, we, we were doing good things in what we thought were typically spastic hamstrings. And now we see that in a lot of the patients, um, it's not doing what we wanted to do. And we can, with the assessment, see the difference, but that's very hard to find clinically. So we haven't, that's why we are using now other measures, for example, ultrasound, which is maybe more accessible to see whether the structure of the muscle can be differentiated, can help us to differentiate the different types of reaction. Good, thank you. Uh, the second question is about, uh, you described two types of muscle. The one is length-dependent muscle, 
and the second is position dependent muscle so can you give us an example so that we can understand it better no it's actually the velocity excuse me the velocity dependent muscle um, which most often we see in, in gastrocnemius um, where you only have a reaction when you do the fast movement and not when you go slowly um, and in hamstrings we more often see this length or position which is the same dependent reaction uh, where even when you go slow in some children, you already see EMG activity. Thank so you. in there, um, we saw the difference that in some children where we have hamstrings that are typically present with velocity dependent activity, the Botrain toxin does what we want it to do, giving better knee extension at the end of swing and initial contact. And in the position dependent hamstrings, we see the contrary, we don't see a good effect. Thank you. Uh, the second question is to uh, Lise uh, about like you describe a lot of options available for improvement of balance. Of these options, which you use at Gillette? I anticipated this question. Um, so, you know, honestly, they they still do a lot of conventional physical therapy. So just practicing certain skills, standing on one foot, balance transfers in sitting in kneeling and standing again, trying to make things fun, like with a game, having them pick stuff up and throw things at a mirror or throw to a therapist. They do have access to like a Nintendo Wii and fit, but from my understanding, it's rarely used partially because the time constraints of the session and to get that all plugged in and then practice, I, I think that it's just not well used. There, I believe is some talk about exploring virtual reality because we have some headsets that are starting to be used more for a pain and anxiety management approach for different treatments or cast removal and stuff. So it might go that direction. We do have a robotic gait trainer, so that is used uh, sometimes as well. But again, I focus on balance outcomes. That can perhaps be better, right, if you look at more gait outcomes. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of it boils down to those conventional physical therapy of practicing range of motion, strength, um, and then balance skills versus any specific intervention that I that I spoke of. Thank you. Uh, coming to uh, the same question to Rainal, because uh, at uh, Basel, I see uh, I saw the perturbation based therapy being used in our research. Is it available for the practice or the clinical situation? Um, no, not yet. But what we actually do is, but I have no data yet. What we do is we want to see the reaction of a patient on a scary situation. So we have patients with a visual virtuality walking on a plank of three or five meters level height. And we see that then these patients, some become very rigid, become very stiff, and we see what happens. And I think before we start to use these things for treatment, we should actually and need to know what happens if the patient experiences these tools. And I think uh, for that reason, we are, we are still a little bit behind. Um, I always want to know the sources and the causes of things before I try to, to apply it to clinical practice. That makes my talk so difficult and my talk so different from others. But um, the final, the final thing is, it is not much different from what we know, but we get a clearer idea. And I think that is what is missing when we use different tools. We don't know why the patient has certain problems. But if we ask patients, if we talk to patients, we get these informations. So um, I, I absolutely agree that, uh, that balance problems are an important thing and we need to treat them. What we currently do is we try to get them more sportively active. So we think that the larger the motor pattern spectrum is that they can, that they can cope with, the better they will function in daily life. 
that is something that they are missing because they are blocked by all their spastic and poor motor control activities. And for that reason, they have not the same experience than we have when they come up to 10, 10 years of age. And they fall more often, they can't uh, protect themselves because the arms are stiff, so they are afraid, and that finally makes them stiff. And there are certain things I think that we need to understand first before we apply simple trainers for a certain problem. That's what we do. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the question is again to um, Anya, uh, is about, uh, again, this question is from Jayant. And he has asked that the usual concept is that the spasticity is more in a children who are younger than seven years. And with age, the spasticity become less. Is it really like that in your study or it's the spasticity is uh, making the muscle stiff and so it's not visible or evident? What is, what is actually the reality? Yeah. And if we look at the different ages that we did the study and there's also older children and it's not so that the spasticity goes away you still see the emg activity so it's still there but yeah we know that on top of it we see more stiffness so it sort of hides the spasticity um so i think it's it's especially in, in children that are quite functional the spasticity can still be a problem um so yeah, for what we see in our research, it's it's still there. Okay, right. So uh, what we used to believe that spasticity become much less after the age of seven, it's not like that uh, with the sophisticated uh, tests. Yeah, if you describe the spasticity as the stretch reflex, re reflex activity that we can document with the EMG, it is still there. Yeah. Over to you, Ishwar, for the further questions. Uh, thank you, everyone, for a great session. Um, I would like to uh, ask Dr. Campenhot, where do you place this instrumented assessment of spasticity of uh, what you have described in a setting of, say, instrumented gait analysis? Do, do you see them complementing each other in the future in, the, in the, the making a total picture of a cerebral palsy case? Uh, yes, at, at the moment we do, especially um, in at, when the like preoperative assessments uh, for multilevel surgery for um, SDR, we also document now pre and post uh, in a prospective study uh, what the spasticity um, is for these patients and combine this um, first of all also with strength assessments. And this is not just the manual muscle assessment, but with uh, um, um, instrumented assessment. Um, and then, of course, do functional tests um, with the GMF, GMFM, but also some functional assessments like a stand up and go and things like that. So, have a complete picture of the child because I think the last is the most important, which is the function, because we don't just want to treat. Uh, gait parameters or spasticity parameters. We just want to improve the, the function. Um, in a more um, resource constrained setting, like in the developing world where we don't have access to these tools yet, in a clinical setting, do you still advocate that a TARDO scale would be a reasonable replacement as you know something that we can still uh, work on with to get a reasonable assessment? Yes, of course. I mean, the Tardio is, 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 might be better than the modified Ashford because you really have a, a slow and a fast movement. So you can differentiate to some extent between the two and have a, an angle of catch, which you can compare before and after. So it gives you a bit a better insight. But you need to be aware that there is problems with objectivity, I mean, with, with uh, fine tuning, I mean, with the exact angle that it's not repeatable in different assessors, but it's uh, it still remains a val valuable clinical tool. Okay. Um, so uh, how do you decide, I mean, uh, you might have uh, mentioned this in your lecture, but just to reiterate the point for people who may have missed it, how do you decide 
uh, whether to implement just the casting or the Botox plus the casting or just the Botox based on your instrumented uh, thing. Um, so for we look at the spasticity pattern. If we I have to admit, we still don't use this in every child before every botulinum toxin injection. It's just when we are uh, sort of doubting what to do. So for young children with a typical spastic gait, um, where we feel that the spasticity is hindering the evolution, not just because it's there, but when it's like giving problems, then I would use the botulinum toxin without doing the instrument as spasticity assessment. But when it's less typical or when the child is older or when the reaction to botulinum toxin was not as good as it, I thought it would be, I would do an instrument as spasticity assessment and look at what type it has and how much stiffness there is in relation to how much spasticity or EMG activity there is. So and if there's more stiffness than EMG, I would go for serial casting uh, or maybe even towards surgery if necessary. Um, and otherwise I would try to go to botulinum toxin again if necessary. Because often we, our strategy changed over the years uh, it's not like we do botulinum toxin in every patient. It's not like we do repeat it in every patient. Um, and often doing, a, especially in very functional ambulatory children where you see spasticity is uh, a big problem and there is a good underlying strength. We know it's possible SDR or selective dorsal rhizotomy candidate. And then we would do uh, assessment of spasticity, do the botulinum toxin injection with multi-level not high doses, but enough, and then reassess and see how the child functions with lower spasticity and determine whether it's a good candidate for a selective dorsal rhizotomy, because they're not always, and it's a good means to uh, assess both in what happens when spasticity is down, and then you can assess it with the DMG, is it really lower? Um, and also with the function, is the child still at least functioning at the same level or improving. And that, of course, we know botulinum toxin only works for a couple of months maximum. Um, so if you don't want to have this effect of lower spasticity, improvement in function as a goal, then we want to have it continuously, then you can go for the SDR. But we use it very sparsely and with a selective number of indications. Thank you. But there again, we also try to document it now with instrumented specificity assessment to really see what we are doing in the long term. But of course, still as a research tool to document what's, what the, the surgery does. Thank you. Uh, a question to you, Dr. Boye. Um, uh, we are so focused in cerebral palsy about what happens at the corticospinal tract. And we kind of, uh, you know, neglect the other tracts, which is the posterior fibers or the spinocerebellar <clears throat> fibers. So in your research, have you focused your attention on the other tracts, like spinocerebellar or the posterior tract, and see how they affect the balance as such? No, and I don't think it's common for clinical purposes for them to try to distinguish which tracks have been effective, affected. We, we have not really explored kind of any of those additional tests or imaging, but I would be very curious about that, right? Especially in some of the papers that are documenting how some of the other descending tracks aren't as good at um, recovering selective motor control, right? When they're adapting for the damaged cortical spinal tract. So I'd be interested in doing that in the future, but have not done that yet. Great question. And is there any, uh, is there any evidence of just like how we have a selective loss of motor control? Is there any evidence and it would be very difficult, I suppose, to uh, say that, like, is there any evidence for a selective loss of sensory control? Like, is there any mixing up of sensation from light touch to pain to prick, uh, you know, uh, almost like a dysesthesia kind of thing in cerebral palsy? Uh, I mean, there, there is this concept of the pain in cerebral palsy, which has piqued interest now. Uh, does that influence the 
a feeling of uh, stability? I have a lot of interest in that area too. I've just recently have done some ankle proprioception studies and trying to look at how that relates to clinical measures of balance. Um, and, and fall frequency that I'm working on analyzing and publishing. But I know there is another, at least one other group in on the East Coast of the United States where she has done some of those measures of light touch, two-point discrimination, proprioception, and look at those impairments and how they're related to static balance. Um, and Renald mentioned it also, right, is that there does seem to be these sensory impairments, but we often don't measure them. We don't quantify them clinically, and we still often neglect them in research. Uh, so I would love to do kind of that big causal model and look at what are the, all the potential factors that are potentially influencing someone's balance and gross motor function and actually quantify all of those and look at them relative to one another and help us identify the most important ones to treat. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Bruna. And then the last question to you. Um, considering all this um, battery of tests we have and all the uh, instruments available at your disposal, how much do you factor in the child's ability? Like the old school uh, cerebral palsy uh, uh, teaching goes like, First, you assess whether the child can communicate, then whether the child can verbalize, when the child is mobile, and then finally, whether the child wants to ambulate. So we have these priorities while teaching cerebral, uh, treating cerebral palsy. Where do you uh, put in the uh, child's ability to uh, comprehend what is being done to him? and uh, you know its ability to improve him that is the mental state of the child how much importance do you give i think it is an essential point um if, if a child doesn't uh, realize what what something that we do would be good for then if they can't see the benefit why should they do any kind of uh, exercise or any kind of um of time involving in such a treatment. So I think it is essential that the child sees a benefit. And uh, I remember that I had two, two um, children of the same school class with the similar crouch. One wanted to be, to be improved and the other one said, why should I? And I did the same kind of surgery. One improved really and the other one remained the same. So yes, if the child is, if the child mentally doesn't understand what uh, what it should be good for, if he or she undergoes pain, um, a lot of time going into a treatment which is otherwise free for football or whatever. So it, it, it is a major, um, it's a major ent enterprise for such a child to go into such a treatment direction. And uh, I think we really, really underestimate the other factors. We really take it down too much to a simple mechanical uh, situation. That's what we do with gait analysis as well, by the way. So we analyze the mechanics of gait. Yes, the mechanics is an essential thing. If you, if you are with a 90 degrees flexed knee, you certainly are not stable enough. That in, explains why surgery produces more stability. So if I correct a crouch position into a straight position, the patient naturally is more stable because he doesn't need to do, to, to do activities to maintain the, um, the posture. So that's much easier. But um, we, we, I think a lot of failures that we have and a lot, lot of estimations that we can't fulfill is because we underestimate the other problems of cerebral palsy that actually are described. So it is not anymore anything that we shouldn't know. These tractographies that I showed, they have been done for 15 or 20 years now. Today, it is easy. You print, you, you press a button and it is calculated. It's just that nobody does so because the neuro um, um, radiologist doesn't want to sit there and uh, work out what, what can be seen, but it's an easy thing to do. 
And yes, I think we should have far more information for everything that we do, considering spasticity treatment, surgery, whatever, before we, before we actually go into a certain detailed treatment plan. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we are at the end of the webinar. I just would like to summarize uh, giving uh, the overview that still we are very basic level understanding the cerebral palsy. And in spite of the best investigation we have, uh, we are not yet ready for uh, best treatment available. Uh, just to give a vote of thanks, I hand over to our secretary, Dr. Sandeep Patwardhan. Over to you, Sandeep. Uh, thank you, Hiran Bhai. So uh, it's been a fascinating evening uh, talking and listening to all these tall words, uh, especially Liz, uh, who gave her perspectives on uh, the research and the sensory part of uh, cerebral palsy. And uh, also Anya, who gave us insights in, into the uh, quantification of spasticity, which was something new I heard for the first time today. And uh, Professor Brunner, as usual, has been very pragmatic and practical. And I think uh, the important thing that he brought out is that uh, how ignorant we are about cerebral palsy despite all this discussion. And ultimately, it's the motivation of the child, the parents, and the society that he lives in which should probably dictate what tools and what methods are we going to use to improve the quality of life for that family, as I put it, not only the child, because the caregivers are equally important. So I think uh, the more we read and the more we hear, uh, the lesser uh, we are uh, knowledgeable is what comes out every time. And it's always illuminating to hear uh, perspectives from all over the world. Thank you, Ishwar, for beautifully coordinating the questions and bringing out the best from each of the speakers. And thank you, Dhiran Bhai, again. Uh, as president of POSI, you have been really great in uh, running this CP series. And uh, I wish everybody a good night. And uh, I hope we meet again together uh, very soon in person. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.